Hello, people watching. We're just waiting for people to show. So um, if you have questions, you can type them and I'll uh, do the best I can. So, okay. Uh, one question we have is what's a good way to stay focused on the reason for the season while being busy with everything? Um, yeah, you know, that's really at the heart of what this season is all about. Um, the season we call Advent, it's really a time for preparation. And you look around the neighborhood, and obviously here in St. Louis Hills, we have Candy Cane Lane and Angel Lane and Snowflake Lane and Lama Lane and, I don't know, uh, Terrapin Lane, whatever they got out there. Um, and it's good to have these lights up, to have their trees up, to uh, be, be preparing for this Christmas season. Um, but also it's a recognition and acknowledgement that we're not yet in the Christmas season. You know, this past weekend we had our uh, Rite of Christian Initiation for Adult meeting uh, that meets every Sunday. That's open to anybody, too. Um, we start at 9.30 with Lexio, and then we have a session after that, talk about different things from the Catechism. Um, and the question came up, you know, what is Advent? And uh, this season of Advent is preparing not only for the Christmas season when Jesus comes to us in Christmas, but also uh, preparing ourselves for when we're going to meet Jesus at the end of time, or even our particular judgment, when our time on this earth is going to come to an end. Um, so I think it's kind of uh, good uh, this time of year to maybe read through, especially uh, the first chapters of Luke and Matthew, and really um, even maybe doing the daily readings that we have for the Masses, because those are all directed towards this preparation time. Um, they're usually centered on John the Baptist, who is the precursor to Jesus, the one that clears the way and prepares the way for the coming of Jesus. And it's a reminder, I think, for us that we're called to do the same. We're called to not only prepare ourselves, but help others to understand um, what the season's all about, what Christmas is really directed towards. Um, and yeah, so I know that's hard to do, especially in the, in the midst of a, hopefully the end of a global pandemic, where uh, we probably want Christmas to come earlier this year, as we did last year, the year before. Um, and in a way, there's probably good in that, uh, that it kind of does foster uh, goodwill uh, and peace. Um, but it's also important, we as Catholics also understand the meaning of time, the purpose of these different seasons, um, the purpose of this time of preparation. And the same thing happens in Lent. Uh, while Lent is a little more penitential in nature, it's really preparing for the coming of Jesus and his resurrection. Well, this is preparing for the coming of Jesus and his actual birth. Um, so I think, practically speaking, reading the scriptures can be very helpful. Um, doing works of charity in this time. Like, you know, Christmas, we don't have to wait for Christmas to go feed the poor and give clothes to those who need it or visit the sick. Um, Doing those corporal and spiritual works of mercy now are good ways of actually preparing ourselves for, for the Christmas season. So um, I'd say that's probably a good thing to do. Uh, read the scriptures, especially the first uh, few chapters of Luke and, 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 Math, and Matthew, um, really what we call the, the infancy narratives of, uh, of Christmas. But also, you know, maybe dedicating that time for these acts of good work and charity, uh, going out and helping our neighbors. Um, you know, it's interesting, the Boy Scouts have a great slogan, uh, it's, it's, do a good turn daily. And I don't think you have to be a Boy Scout to do that. Uh, I think we make a, uh, a focused effort every day to do acts of service. Um, we, we tend to find that the opportunities come frequently, and also it leads to more good acts of service, more good, more good works. So maybe that's the longer answer, but yeah, I think doing those corporal and spiritual works and can be helpful, as well as reading the scripture on a daily basis um, can be good. So good. Yeah, thank you for the question. If there's any other questions, please feel free to go ahead and write them in the comment section. Uh, there's nobody here with me now, um, so if you want to join me, <laughs> if, there's, if there's a lot of questions, um, we'll probably just wait, like, wait like 10 minutes if anyone shows up. But if you want to come join in person, you're more than happy and more than welcome to do that. The Tam Avenue door is open to the basement here, so you're more than welcome through and, and hang out and ask any questions you may have. Um, or if you just feel more comfortable typing them up in the comment section, 
That'll work too. That's understandable. If you're making making stuff for a coworker, that's always good to do. Another way of actually getting involved in the season, right? So good. Yeah, um, journaling can certainly be beneficial. Um, you know, I, I would say my, my spiritual director probably would appreciate me doing that more. I typically journal on um, retreats. Um, I find that's probably, that's very helpful, especially when I meet my spiritual director every day. Um, but I don't really do that um, in my own personal prayer time. I guess, hmm, I probably should. Uh, but. I also have to admit, usually my personal prayer time, especially especially with the, the scripture, is usually usually dedicated to um, uh, homily prep. So I do take notes in a way; they're more mental notes, I guess. And especially for the Sunday homily, I definitely take notes for that. Um, so I guess I guess yeah, I probably should, but I don't as much. What is the best way to write those notes so when I come back to them, they make sense? Well, handwriting is important. That's that's one of my problems. My handwriting is not the best. Usually I have to like decipher it in a way. Um, but I think it's important not necessarily just write down full sentences. Um, sometimes just writing ideas is really the best way to retain them. So key words, maybe key phrases. Um, you know, it's not necessarily, it's not really necessary in journaling to write a tome, but maybe bullet points can be helpful. And that's going to be different for everybody. Um, some people may need full sentences in order to actually recall uh, what the Holy Spirit is telling them. Um, some are good just with like words or bullet points. Um, and, and generally too, some people just don't, appreciate, don't really like it. I mean, and that's okay too, right? I mean... Sometimes just receiving something in the moment um, is good for just that moment. It's still a gift from God. It's still a gift uh, to you. Um, and also sometimes, um, like especially with, with the practice of Lectio Divina, um, some things may not necessarily need to be shared. Uh, I always make it a point whenever we have our, our Sunday sessions with our, with our Lectio Divina is that you, know, you don't have to share what's being shared with you by the Holy Spirit may be just for you. And in a way, there's a discernment because the discernment is, well, is just this, just a gift for me or am I meant to actually share this with other people? And journaling is typically directed towards that, just sharing with other people. Um, some of the great saints, right, the great doctors of the church that we know, we wouldn't necessarily know what they said unless they wrote it down, right? Um, and that's not an issue of pride. That's not like a thing of pride. Like St. Teresa of Lisieux, um, we would never say she was prideful. But she wrote these things down in her diary because it was good for her to reflect on. It was, it was good for her to remember these things the Lord was giving her. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess if we want, if we have designs or we're being called sainthood, which we all are, it probably would be good to write these things down in certain ways. Um, but I think as far as how we record them, what makes sense, 
Um, maybe even audio recording might be good, you know? Um, just kind of like, you know, talk through those things. I think that really depends on each individual and what, how they best uh, receive these things and how they best um, um, can recall these things. So maybe that's, maybe that's a video, maybe that's um, audio, maybe that's actually physical writing down. Um, there are studies show that writing things down uh, help you remember them better. Um, but yeah, I think everyone's a little different when it comes to those things. So great. Yeah, thanks for the question. Like somebody's coming. Oh, hi. There's answering things online right now, so we had a few questions, but uh, we'll see if anyone else shows up. I was going to call it early if uh, nobody's asked questions, but we got three questions online so far that have been answered, I think, hopefully sufficiently. Sorry, can't hear my traffic. That's all good. It's all good. Do you have anything? Oh, I have a couple. Great. Well, go ahead. Floor is yours. So, Father James Martin. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan. Um, why are people so afraid of welcoming people from the LGBTQ community into the Catholic Church? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's necessarily a fear of welcoming. I, I think it's openness. There's, a, there's a, you know, what it comes down to is there, there's sometimes a, a, a misinterpretation and, and distinction between the actions people do and the person themselves. And so it's not that people that experience same-sex attraction are closed off to the church or not welcome here. I think sometimes though we tend to label ourselves and each other based on what we do. And so when someone identifies that their whole identity is based on the fact that they're in a relationship with somebody else, the church is very clear by saying that that's not how you should identify yourself. Your identity is relational, but it's relational with God, right? That's how we have identity, through our baptism, through our relationship with, with Jesus Christ. So when someone would label themselves as saying like, well, my identity is the fact that I am attracted to a certain sex. Well, okay, part of that is understanding, well, that may be where you are, right? And we want to get you to, to a deeper understanding. That's the goal of the church. Um, but also that requires an openness on the other side too, right? So there's this, this theological maxim or theological principle called the mode of the receiver. Um, we think of it this way, like um, when we were maybe in second or third grade or maybe fifth grade, whatever, you know, going to Catholic school, you're probably taught certain tenets of the faith that you don't necessarily receive well because, well, maturity level, maybe the way it was presented wasn't that great or maybe the way we understand things is different, right? So we call that the mode of the receiver. That tends to change over time, right? That we receive things differently when we're adults than when we're children. So when it comes to certain aspects of, of, of these of people that experience these different uh, attractions, um, that's kind of part of it too. There's perception that, oh, well, the church hates me because I do X. And that's never what the church was taught. A lot of these are kind of self-imposed identities. Now, can we do better in reaching out and actually engaging with people? Absolutely. I don't think this is all just one side, right? Part of it is understanding how to do that. So when you talk about things like Father James Martin, um, I always try to reserve judgment because what I see with him is he may be, and for those who don't know, Father James Martin is a, um, is a Jesuit priest who's written some books recently of uh, engagement with people that experience same-sex attraction or also known as LGBTQIA, whatever now it is. I know that's not yeah. Um, You're so woke. No, well, I try. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of criticism of his writing because it seems like he is condoning um, certain actions which are uh, against church teaching. I don't necessarily read that in him. I think what he's trying to do is engage people where they're at. Um, and that's why I'm reserving judgment because 
next book may try to elevate, right? I don't know. I don't know Father James Martin. I don't know, you know, what, where he's trained or what theologies he really kind of, you know, attests to. Um, but I'm always willing to kind of reserve judgment in these things until the full tome and the full body of work is actually presented. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's, there's always, there's kind of a, there's kind of an interesting question when, when people ask that, it's like, why is the church so against, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, it's not that we're against people. We love people. We always love people. And regardless of what they do, we always want to love them and give them dignity. Um, but that doesn't mean we condone everything that they do, right? I mean, look at that everywhere. I mean, look at look at our family lives. Like, our families do things that we may not really like, yet we still love them. And I think that's kind of a, a can that's a good analogy for the church, that we love all God's children. It doesn't mean we condone everything they do, right? That's the whole nature of sin, right? We don't condone sin, regardless of what that is. Um, and doesn't, that doesn't just mean same-sex attraction people. That means any sin. <laughs> we, we're, not, we're not really from sin at all. So, uh, but we still love, and that's really the key. So we say that it's okay you know, to have same-sex attraction as long yeah. as you don't act on it. Yeah, I mean, the same thing with, like, it's okay to have a, an attraction to the opposite sex, too. But again, we are, what controls us is not our emotions, our desires. It's our rationale. Right, our reason. So, how much okay for like two teenagers, boy and girl, to like hold hands and kiss and stuff, but they're, they're not having, they're not, yeah. you know, having sex. But how come it's, but it's wrong for two guys or two girls to do that? Well, I'm not saying it is. I, I think that, you know, signs of affection are not necessarily wrong. So <clears throat> the question though is, um, well, even you can even make the argument that even two teenagers who kiss, maybe, a lot of it depends on where the line may be, right? And so I think that the the rule of thumb typically would be, if you want to feel comfortable doing this in front of your parents, you probably shouldn't do it in a non-marital relationship, right? We're talking just primarily a, or maybe romantic, maybe just a deep friendship. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing too, I think we have to make a distinction between a marriage, mm -hmm. right, and a deep friendship. You know, having a deep friendship doesn't necessarily mean you can't kiss someone, mm -hmm. right, or hug someone, or hold hands. That, that's a sign of affection, and that's we all need that as human people, human persons. That's much different, though, than saying, oh, this marriage, this is a marriage, and it's equal to the marriage between a man and a woman. Well, we can't say that. And really, the re reason we can't say that is because of the products of those marriage, of those relationships. That a man and a woman in a, in a marriage bond, it's not only sacramental and unitive, but it's also procreative that two men and two women just cannot engage it naturally. They don't have the potential for that at all, right? Two men and two women can have a very deep friendship. No one's saying they can't do that. And that could, that could actually be a sign of affection. It's just not marriage. It's not, oh yeah, definitely. We would, yeah, we wouldn't say it would be marriage, no. Of course not, no. And because, because we have to look, in order to find something, we have to look at the ends of them. Right, and so the end of a marriage would be sacramental, appropriative, unitive. Well, maybe a two men can have a deep unity, but that still would be equal to the unity that men and women would share in marriage. Right? It could even be like maybe life giving. People can see them say, "Oh, that's very, that's very, they're very affectionate. That's very, very good to see," you know. But that wouldn't be the same procreative aspect that man and woman would have. The complementarity of those two beings. Is, is just or, ordained by God in that respect, mm -hmm. by their very natures. We can't say the same for two mm -hmm. men or two women. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I think Father Martin, I think he's, uh, it's noble. I think he's, I, I, that's why I, I would assume generally, I would assume that he's trying to actually engage people that experience this and bring them to the truth and understanding of the faith. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't doubt that. Um, you can always say, can methods be better? Well, sure. Mm -hmm. And same thing for the Catholic Church, right? We can engage probably in better ways and deeper ways. Um, but I think it's also a two-way street. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got to be, it has to be both and not either or. You know. I have another one. Okay. Why, what is the Church's reasoning? And I'm, I just, because I, I get this on the page and everything mm -hmm. a lot. Why, why can't women be priests in 
Yeah, um, so there's kind of several reasons <laughs> that women uh, can't be priests. Um, first off, I think oftentimes when this, this discussion happens, usually it's a discussion about power. I agree. Right. Because like if I, if I chose, I, I discerned a little bit in high school, mm -hmm. senior year, and um, a very little bit, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> but the biggest one is, is like, okay, well, you can be a cloistered nun, you can take about silence, you can take about poverty, or you can be a priest and you don't have to take about poverty or anything, and you get a <coughs> Well, some priests do. Yes. Yeah. But you can, you know, yeah, um, or yeah. they do a couple that do not. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and you get to be, you know, you get to be a leader, you have a leadership opportunity, and you get to celebrate Mass, and you, you know, you get the term of Father, and, yeah. um, and it kind of seems like girls don't, they don't have that opportunity to be leaders in the church. Well, okay, so I think there's there probably was that concept early, uh, probably pre-Vatican II, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's changed in this understanding about leadership with Vatican II. There's really a call more for for women leadership in the in the role of the church. Now, now how that how that manifests itself? Well, you know, here's the thing: the priesthood itself is not directed towards power. The priesthood is sure. is, a, is, a, is a yeah is a is a sacrament of service, mm -hmm. right? And so if I wanted power, I should stay with both, <laughs> right? This is a ministry of service. And so that's first off, we want to be clear about that. Then usually that kind of, that usually takes away about maybe half the arguments. Um, the other are more theological. So for instance, um, when we understand the sacrament of, of, of holy orders, do you, do you know when that actually was instituted by Jesus? It was instituted at the Last Supper. And so it started with um, Jesus girded his loins, put on an apron, and started washing the, 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 the mm -hmm. disciples' feet, right? Um, that we would understand as the establishment of the diaconate, right? At that moment, he made his 12 apostles deacons. The priesthood came about when Jesus instituted the Eucharist. He said, do this in remembrance of me to those apostles that are present there, which we would understand that ordained them priests. Um, and then eventually they were made bishops in the actual resurrection and ascension of Jesus. So the question is, who was present at the Last Supper? Well, our understanding based on Jewish ritual of the Passover was the sexes were divided. Men would go with men, women would be with women. So the people that were there at the Last Supper in the upper room were Jesus and his 12. All men, right? If anyone deserved to be a priest, we would surely say it would have been Mary. Well, Mary, yeah, Virgin Mother, right? Mary Magdalene, probably sure, but definitely Mary. She was born without sin. She had the, the grace, but yet she wasn't there. And so we would say, well, why did Jesus do this? I mean, because, well, he wasn't really all about norms. Well, he wasn't really necessarily about societal norms, but he was a devout Jew. And the way that celebrate the, the, the juridical, not the juridical, but the ceremonial law would dictate that the Passover would be celebrated with your same sex. So you would have followed that law being a righteous, devout Jew. <clears throat> but also, if we're understanding of the Eucharist, it makes sense too. So when Jesus gave us himself in the Eucharist, he gave himself, he gave his body to us, which was the body of a man. And I think this is probably the best argument to say that Jesus gave to himself to us as a man. And so it would make sense the person performing the sacrificial rite, who is also saying the person of Jesus Christ, would also be a man. But how did Jesus get here? Well, that's, well, that's true. He came from the and the Holy Spirit. But also, we know that he was a man because typically they were crucified naked. Right? So you can tell that Jesus was a man. But he gave himself to us as a man. And therefore it makes sense that the person giving himself would also be a man. This also kind of makes sense in the context of, of a marital relationship. That at every Eucharist, Jesus takes his bride to church. And the matter for any marriage is a man and a woman. And so the church is the, the, the bride. And the, the priest is taking the, the place of Jesus in that bond. So it all does correspond and, and flows from this understanding of not only Catholic anthropology, like the purpose of man and woman, 
Um, but also, it makes sense in the context of the sacraments and the Eucharist and the marriage, that this is what these, these are celebrating. Um, and it really, I mean, you could, you could, people ask, well, why would Jesus do that? Well, I don't know. I mean, you could ask him. But if Jesus was the one to institute these things in this way, the church really has no right or authority to actually change it. Now, it could be a different story if Jesus actually came as a woman. You can make different arguments why that could have been, could have been good, right? It could have been um, a different story, right? But for whatever reason, in the divine plan, God made Jesus, a, Jesus became man, gave himself to us as a man, sacrificed himself as a man. So it makes sense the minister in that sacrament of sacrifice would also be a man. And part of that's just because what man gives himself in a way that a woman can't, a woman gives herself in a way that a man can't. That's just the nature of, of humanity. And so that's why we would say that would be the reasoning. I think the Eucharistic uh, reasoning is probably the best argument, personally. It's not to say that women, you know, women wasn't, I mean, Mary was incredibly, she was very important in the whole role. But for some reason, Mary was not in the room during the Last Supper <coughs> to institute the Eucharist and the priesthood. Um, let's see here. I don't think I don't have a central email for that. All right. That's how to make the most of a busy life. Um, I think when we're talking about busy life, I think proper, the, the important thing there is actually what we call leisure. You know, when, if we're completely busy all the time, it tends to like um, wear us out. Uh, leisure, though, is important, I think, when we talk about busyness, um, just because we need that balance of life. And so leisure, when I say that, I don't necessarily mean like vegging out, watching TV on the couch. That could be leisure. I don't know. Leisure, properly speaking, though, is an activity or engagement that rejuvenates us, right? It's really an act of self-care. Um, and that could be anything that really does that for you. Um, but ultimately it allows us to engage our, our relationships with more zeal, more, and our obligation more zeal, more joy, more peace. Um, so that would be my real, probably my only advice when it comes to a busy life, um, is to make sure you have proper leisure um, in the context mm -hmm. of that too. So, yeah, so you have a question online about how to make the most of a busy life. So, any other, anyone else have any ideas, please feel free, but otherwise any other questions? I have two questions. <coughs> the first one, they both pertain to a, um, a woman who has a, a website on, on the internet, and she called Angel something other. She's a Protestant. Mm -hmm. And she, I was reading this uh, page she had, and she had about, uh, she was talking about the Catholic Church. She was trying to explain the Catholic Church through her eyes, okay. as she saw it as a, as a Protestant. And um, she asked several questions, and I thought uh, she made several assertions, which I thought as a Catholic, practicing Catholic, I should be able to answer. Mm -hmm. Because she basically, she based everything on the Bible. Sure, okay. which, yeah. And right. that, I mean, that, that's the Protestant thing. Yeah, okay, right. Well, if it's not in the Bible, or if it is in the Bible. <clears throat> the one um, issue was with purgatory. Mm -hmm. She. Um, her claim was that since purgatory is not mentioned in the Bible, <laughs> Catholics are just wrong when they talk about purgatory, people going to purgatory. Right. Now, that's a big deal in the Catholic Church for right. all of us because right. my understanding is that nothing unclean goes to heaven. Correct. So if you are born, how many of us are saints when we when yeah. die, okay? So in other words, it seems like an either are. Either you're going to go to heaven, you're going to go to hell, and you better make sure you walk the straight and narrow and you're in perfect shape when you die. And well, let's, well, first off, I think make a distinction there, depending on what denomination we're talking about. Some particular Protestants would believe that you don't necessarily have to even do good works or even do good to get to heaven. It's just a belief in Jesus. So if you proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord, that's all that's necessary is for, for eternal salvation, right? Now, we can make arguments, even from Scripture, to say, well, what about, you know, James talks about faith and works, and Jesus puts a lot of emphasis on doing good in the world. 
And the response we usually get from that would be, well, yeah, what, what if, you're, if you have faith, good work should flow from that. Okay, we'll grant you that. I think that's kind of, there's some truth in that too. But I think then we would even say, well, that, yeah, but it seems that both and would be necessary. Because one could have faith and not necessarily do good, right? And so if you're taking the, 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 the uh, fide, sola, sola fides, or sola scriptura aspect, and say that only faith is necessary, well, all right, but Jesus really speaks up against that quite often. So I want to make that first, first clear. Um, and it would make sense that, uh, that a Protestant would say that purgatory is not in the Bible because, well, it is, but it may not be in their Bible. And the reason being, the, the primary source we get for purgatory comes from actually the Old Testament. And it comes from one in First and Second Maccabees. Now, for, yeah, for a Protestant, though, <coughs> First and second Matthews would be considered apocrypha, meaning it's not part of the canon. And sometimes the question is, why do Catholics add books to the Bible? Well, the answer to that is, we didn't. Those books of the Bible were established not only in the Council of Nicaea, but even ratified and solidified in the Council of Trent. So for 1,500 years, one and two Maccabees was in the Bible. It was being brought out in the liturgy, it was being discussed and actually um, homilized, by different, you know, clergy and other lay people. Um, and in Maccabees, they talk about, um, it's really a historical book about the Greek occupation of Israel. That the Greeks came in after the Persians, they established temples and actually put up a temple, uh, put up some statues and altars in the temple, which caused a lot of consternation. And so Judas Maccabees and his brothers uh, rebelled right, and fought off the Greeks. They actually called in the Romans to help, too. Um, and in there, there's a story about um, they went to battle, and uh, a lot of his people died. They won the battle, but there was a lot of casualties. And what they found was all the casualties on the Israel side, on the Maccabee side, they found these little idols that were on the persons of the people that died, which means that they weren't following the law of God, right? They're putting their faith in something else other than God. But Judas does there is something very interesting at this moment. He takes a collection for a sacrifice on behalf of the deceased, right? Now, why would you do that if these people are in hell? There's an understanding there for, for even for the Jews that if someone were in Sheol, if someone were in hell, they were in hell. Nothing they could, we could do on this earth could help them. Yet, Judas Maccabees does a sacrifice for them in reparation for what they did. Now, why would you do that other, unless there was a, a, some place you went that wasn't quite heaven, wasn't quite hell, um, to be saved eventually? But also, too, as you rightly said, Jesus says in the Bible, you know, be perfect, your heavenly Father is perfect, right? So a lot of this is really coming from a rationale standpoint. Well, None of how many of us are really perfect when we actually leave this earth? You know, perfection is a pretty high bar. And so it would make sense just from a philosophical standpoint, there would be some place that we would go to actually obtain that level of perfection, which we understand to be purgatory. Right? There's a purging of the things of this world to perfect us to a state where we can be received into heaven. So oftentimes, sometimes the conception of purgatory, especially from our Protestant brothers and sisters, is that it's like a way station. It's like, okay, well, you, you could still go to hell, you could, you know, but really you're being judged, you're trying to perfect yourself, get to that, maybe, maybe that final, final stretch to get in, right? Well, we understand that purgatory, anyone there in purgatory is just destined for heaven. But they're just in a state of purgation, a state of perfection to get that point where they can enter into heaven, right? A just, loving God wouldn't just condemn everybody if they're not perfect, right? That would, doesn't make sense, just rationally speaking. And so it would make sense that he would give every opportunity for us to get to that point. So is purgatory maybe a few seconds? Is it, well, time doesn't exist in purgatory. Who really knows? Maybe it's just a level of like, okay, I'm sorry for everything I've done. I love you, Lord. Please let me in. Maybe that's purgatory. I don't know. We'll find out, probably. <laughs> right? I mean, but um, but yeah. So that's. I think what would be very clear that uh, 
even Jesus kind of speaks about this love of perfection, and it would make sense that a just and loving God would also allow us to do that too, right? Uh, even in his, his discussion with the Pharisees, he talks about God being the God of the living, not of the dead. But he then refers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Well, they were dead at the time he said this. So what does that mean, right? Even the Jews believed they couldn't get into heaven without reconciliation with God because of the sin of Adam and Eve. Which meant that Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, well, they couldn't get in either. So they had to be somewhere where they're not in hell and somewhere they're not in heaven. Where would that be? Well, purgatory seems to make sense from a rational standpoint. But also I think we can say it's scriptural too. <clears throat> and also Mary mentions purgatory, right? Blessed Virgin Mary, she'll mention... She's mentioned purgatory? In her vision, she does. So she, she talks about, especially when she talks about the scapular or about immaculate metal, right? So it's also, it's no, <coughs> there's, there's, a, there's a, a devotion that says that if you were to die with the, the scapular, the brown scapular on, right? Mary kind of uses it as like a fishing line to pull you out of purgatory, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so in some of the operations, Mary does talk about that. Not necessarily scripturally. But she does talk about it in some of her apparitions. Yes. Well, that leads to my second question. Um, another <clears throat> comment this person made was that about well, it basically comes down to the immaculate conception. Mm. That um, she quotes the, the Bible, I guess Paul uh, uh, saying that um, everyone is falls short yeah. of God. Um, everyone, right. and that includes Mary. You know, and right. so. How can Catholics come up with this concept of Mary being born without original sin? It's yeah, she said she her claim was just contradicts the Bible. Well, I guess I would say, does Paul also include Jesus? Because Jesus is human. Does that mean he falls short too of God? That doesn't make much sense. Um, I would we would also say that that Mary wasn't the first one to receive that grace either. Um, Adam and Eve received that same grace, right? They were made without original sin with what we call their preternatural gifts. It wasn't until they actually sinned that broke that bond, right? So there's already scriptural references already now to that, but it doesn't necessarily fit Paul. So what does Paul mean? Well, I think Paul would mean in general, right? But, uh, God does have the authority to provide that grace if he so desires. In the grand scheme of things, it would make sense that God would have to be born from a perfect vessel too. So the only, so the only person that could actually rectify the situation with Adam and Eve for us would be God. Which meant God would have to become human, or at least to come to us in some way. Right? To, to actually restrain, restore that bond. Which means if God is perfect, he would also need something perfect in which to be born into come about well then that's where Mary would come into play so um, it was her yes that really negated the no of Adam and Eve so we get to actually get that from scripture too the song of songs and even um, the wisdom of Solomon talks about um, this garden that only the king was allowed to enter right that no man could defile or enter into well, the belief is that actually is a is a foreshadowing of the Virgin Mary, which also comes from Isaiah: "The Virgin shall be with child." Right. Well, how can that be unless there's a grace given for that to happen? So, I, yeah, I think that's. I, I think we have to understand too that a lot of times these gospels not not that Paul's in error, but I think Paul is also writing to a particular group. Right? He's trying to convey a message, a catechesis, to a particular group of people in his, his letters. And so part of that is also understanding what's going on in that particular region where this maybe needs to be said. A lot of the places that Paul's writing, there's a lot of sin going on. There's a lot of confusion. And so part of that is understanding solidarity that, yeah, look, all human beings, we fall in some way, right? We all fall short. Um, but you can't say that about Jesus. You can't say that about Adam. Adam and Eve did, but they weren't made that way. And so it would make sense also there would be a, a vessel that allows for that perfect 
mean to come in, into existence, which would say have been the Virgin Mary. And so she had to be given that grace in order for that to happen. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, okay. especially about <clears throat> Cat and Eve. I yeah. never thought of that. And Jesus look up to him as man and God. So now we <clears throat> Yeah, so so would you say that did God that Jesus would be like two or his man had fell short, but well, we can't say that. That just doesn't, that doesn't is not what we understand he used to be, right? So I think we could say that Paul making those statements was for a particular purpose directed towards that audience, but also was more generalized rather than like completely exhaustive. Maybe that's probably a better way of putting it. Right. When you go back to the Immaculate Conception and the original sin. I haven't seen it yet, but apparently the Chosen that's in the theaters now, the Christmas story, mm -hmm. it shows Mary as having a painful birth. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, we'll have to understand, too, that the Chosen was is really kind of, is being created by more Protestant producers, <laughs> and you know. Um, and so, yeah, we would we would say from a Catholic perspective, because of the grace given to Mary, that she, wasn't born that she was to not have a pain, painful because birth. Because she doesn't carry the sin right. of Eve. Right, exactly. And so, it would have been painless. Now, some are processing, well, what about the woman in Revelation? Isn't that Mary? Yeah, we would say that would be Mary too, but, but the, the, birth, the birth that she's giving to in that scenario wasn't Jesus, but the church, right? So, yeah, we cause pain to Mary just as we do Jesus whenever we sin and do things that are against God's law. That's the pain experienced by the woman in Revelation, who also would be a symbol of Mary. She's also our mother too. That was happened at the foot of the cross with John. Um, so yeah, we would we would probably argue that point like, eh, you know, I I think the chosen for the most part is very good, but uh, yeah, there's certain things like theologically, like especially with I think that's probably the only one I, I can think mm -hmm. of in that series where it's like, eh, yeah, I don't know if that's really accurate. Um, but we would have to hold that Mary had a painless birth because she had the preternatural gifts that Adam and Eve had too. Yeah. I, I always wondered what kind of baby Jesus was. Did he what, cry he, when he was he little? Colicky, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, you know, some people when they pray the rosary, you know, the rosary you can make up your own. You can make up your own mysteries. And I, I, some others find it helpful to like pray with the fact, like you know, the first time Mary changed Jesus' diaper, or the first time Mary had to burp her or breastfeed Jesus. Right? I think it'd be helpful. I mean, Jesus was human; he needed things just like we would all need those things, right? Um, you know, one of, one of my great professors in Christology, um, who was also the former associate here, Father Chris Seiler, would say that uh, if Jesus were to do anything, he would do it perfectly. So if he were colicky, if he were perfect colicky, uh -huh. if he were to fall, he would have fallen perfectly, right? Um, and probably only once. <laughs> so, so part of the. Yeah. Well, it, well, see, now that also is, mm -hmm. that's also based on um, St. Francis Sisi's prayer. That was a personal revelation. And so, would it be reasonable to say that Jesus fell three times in his, his crucifixion? Sure. Right? Um, there's nothing, though, in the Bible or anywhere else that really would solidify that. So, yeah, we also have to take into consideration um, personal revelation compared to what the church teaches. Um, but when it comes to, like, you know, how Jesus, where was the human, where was the divine, how that kind of interplay, a lot of that's a mystery that Mary, you know, only maybe Mary and the people at the time would have known. Um, but also, I think there's something to be said with the fact that Jesus needed to be fed. He needed to have his diaper changed. He needed to learn how to speak. Um, part of that comes down to, like, the knowledge uh, so my Christology teacher, Father Sile, would posit that Christ had three types of knowledge. He had divine knowledge, knowledge of all things in existence. Um, he had angelic knowledge, which is like the, the understanding of the essence of all things. And human knowledge was more experiential. So in other words, Jesus probably knew from the very early days the purpose of a nail, a hammer, how that's used, how that would actually drive into a piece of wood to put it together know every detail of how that would work but he wouldn't have known what the hammer felt like or the vibration of the hammer until he actually did it as a human person because before the incarnation jesus didn't have a body 
right? How does God hear or see or, well, I don't know. But Jesus did have a human body where he could actually experience these things. And he, we would hold that because he was God, he would have known the purpose of all these things, the actual being of all, the essence of all these things. But he would have known how it felt to hold a hammer or what the sound of the nail hitting the wood or the hammer hitting the nail would have sounded like until he actually had a body. So these are one of the kinds of, these are some of the great mysteries of the incarnation that we can ponder. And we can hold either one of all these things, right? Um, yeah. Was Jesus a colony? Yeah, maybe probably. You know, he was a baby just like everyone else. Well, when he was circumcised, did he cry? I mean, was it? That, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I would imagine he, he, well, he felt pain, obviously, right? He felt pain at the, at the, uh, the scourging. Um, he didn't cry then. I don't know. At the scourging? Yeah. Uh, when he was beaten. Oh, you know, I yeah, 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 yeah. So you guys have seen The Passion of the Christ, right? Yeah. Yeah. They say that's probably the most accurate depiction of what actually happened to Jesus. Um, it's thought often positive that like you know there's like 40 lashes. Well, at the time in the Roman Empire, they didn't do anything number-wise. It was probably more common practice that the entire cohort would have taken a turn beating him until they got tired, mm -hmm. not until he got tired. And the whole purpose of the scourging from Pilate's standpoint was um, usually it led to death anyway. <coughs> But he was trying to show the people, like, oh, oh, look, I took care of it. He's already taken care of, right? He's not going to bother anymore. I beat him severely. But then they called for his execution anyway, right? So not only was he beaten to death, then he had to take on this 200-pound cross and then hang there for three hours. So that gives some credibility that he actually was God because I don't think any other human person, regardless of their physical stature, could have done that. Well, when, when you think, when you actually try to picture yourself being in Jesus' place and the passion, I couldn't have done any of those things. Like in the agony in the garden, my first reaction would have been, hey, let's get out of here. Let's, mm -hmm. let's hightail it to Egypt. Right. I, I don't want to suffer this horrible thing. Right, right. But, but Jesus took it. He, he, yeah. he, he did not run away. Yeah. That's something I could not have done. And carrying that heavy cross, yeah. I, he must have been very strong. Well, he's a carpenter, which not necessarily meant like woodwork. I mean, it could also include like masonry or like you know any type of like day laboring type of work. So he would have been probably pretty fit. Um, but regardless, usually the thing is, the Roman Empire would never have done both scourging and crucifixion. Jesus is the only time in history that's ever really been reported that way. So, to say that he suffered a death that no one else experienced. That's 100% true, right? Well, when you said that you, you don't think you could do the agony in the garden, you know, he, Jesus even said, mm -hmm. hey, hey, if we can do this another way, um, <laughs> is, is that a possibility? Yeah. Maybe I'll do it, but, you know, yeah, we got a plan B. Many sure. scholars, that's, 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 also, that's also kind of shown his humanity kind of exactly. Um Exactly. But, but I think the takeaway from there is that his will still, his human, human will still conformed. It was still open to what was going to happen. Yeah, there's any other way, great. But if this is the only way, okay. Right. Well, yeah, this is an act of free will. I mean, he, he could have run away. Yeah, yeah, of course uh, he could. Well, he could have. Well, he, well, he could have come down off the cross if he wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> he could have done things a lot of different ways if he really wanted to, but he didn't. Every moment of that was a choice. What was actually kind of uh, moving, um, you know, the the deacons. I'm not sure Molly does this. The deacons always go to the Holy Land. Well, most years. Uh, for their retreat, yeah, um, um, before they were ordained the priesthood, and um, one of the most moving things, uh, yeah, the 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 Church of Holy Sepulchre is amazing. Don't get me wrong, but one thing that was kind of moving for me personally was we went to um, the house of Caiaphas, where Jesus would have been throughout the night, and we actually saw the dungeon where he was actually placed, and so because you know he was there on Thursday night into Friday morning. And what they would do is they would hang the prisoners from the, the ceiling by their hands, and their feet would just barely not even touch the ground. So you're thinking, you know, he he's came from the egg in the garden after having a supper. He hung there all night, right? And actually, we actually pray Psalm 88, 
which is the same alt psalm that's sung that's said at uh, night prayer on on Friday nights. It's actually not a very cheerful um, psalm. Most psalms they kind of have like a flow, like they'll start with like, "Okay, Lord, you're great. You've done all these things. I'm a worm. I suck as a human being, but you still help me and love me and, and raise me up." That's how most psalms are kind of directed. They have this kind of arc. Psalm 88 is not. It actually ends on a low note. It's like, I'm in darkness and you're leaving me here. That's basically how it ends. It's like, oh. And that would have been the same psalm that Jesus would have prayed on his own night prayer that night when he was hung, hanging from the ceiling. So you have to imagine he's hanging there, not getting any sleep, right? The psalm is being fulfilled at that moment when he's doing these things. And he's brought to trial, beaten to within an inch of his life, taken the cross, and then died. But that was really kind of moving. To be there in that moment and pray that psalm in that space was just kind of like, wow. You kind of get the understanding of what actually, even the beginning of how that all started and what actually went into the crucifixion of Jesus. So, yeah. Good. Well, it's 8.33. Any questions, comments, or anything else you guys want to discuss? Well, I think I got my two questions answered. Okay. I, I feel like I can go back to an answer to this woman now. Over there. I mean, she has this whole litany of complaints about the Catholic Church. <laughs> Where yeah. are we are wrong? <laughs> yeah, well, and, yeah. And, um, I, and it's, it's funny because, you know, so it is kind of interesting. Um, most things I see online when it comes like the other way around, like there's usually critiques go one way, right? They come from someone else towards the Catholic Church, and they're usually pretty venomous or negative. Most of what I see online when when there's an engagement that way, the opposite way, it's really more respectful, and it's really more of a dialogue. Um, I, I I wonder where she maybe made. I mean, part of this is conceptions. It's actually funny in seminary we were told we were talking about canon law. And uh, this kind of maybe illustrates in a small way, like kind of what I'm talking about. Um, we were told uh, that uh, the priest of teaching canon law, when it came to like marriage, uh, there's a huge misconception on marriage preparation from people that are not Catholic. And to show this, uh, this priest was prepping a couple down in Texas, and the the man was Catholic and the woman was some other denomination. Who knows? And when they were getting close to their last meeting, the woman stopped, uh, you know, asked the priest so. Well, when do we then hook up? And the priest said, well, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And what she was implying was that they would actually at some point have sex, the priest and this woman. Well, yeah, he was like, well, no, we don't do that. Well, she was told by her preacher that in the Catholic Church, if you try to get married in the Catholic Church, the priest has to engage in the sexual act with the bride-to-be in order to, I guess, test it out. I don't, I don't know what the, what, the, what the rationality was. But she was told this. And she, he found this in other places too, in other denominations where we're telling their people, well, yeah, the Catholic Church does this. You don't hear that the other way around, right? Catholic preachers and priests don't preach about other denominations, what they do, right? Um, and especially don't try to, to seed in misconceptions and whatever, right? Um, so I, I always try to take that with a grain of salt when, when seeing these things online because my impression is you're probably coming either from a place of misinformation or malice. I would typically assume misinformation first, charitably. But some actually come from a place of malice. And I think, I realized later after doing some research, I think the concept that came from an old ancient uh, rite of what they call prima nocta. You, you guys seen Braveheart? Have you ever seen the movie Braveheart? Right, right, yeah. yeah. Right. So we know there's this scene at the very beginning when William Wallace is there, they're having this wedding, and the, the lord of the land comes and takes the bride into his old great bridal chamber. That was a, a, a right of law that was given to lords back in the Middle Ages. Now, some bishops were lords, right? And so that would be granted to them, but also they took a vow of celibacy. So I think that's where the misconception was coming from. Uh, to my knowledge, there was never a Catholic bishop that ever actually presented the right of prima nocta. But uh, if they were to do that, it would have been sinful and wrong, right? 
But regardless, <coughs> I think that's probably where the misconception comes from. But apparently there are denominations out there that still teach that to their people. That's what the Catholic Church does. Was the um, Martin Luther who took out the book of Maccabees? So Martin Luther was the one that removed uh, Maccabees, Sirach, um, he removed seven books. It's one, two Maccabees, Sirach, uh, what were the other? There was, um, let me pull up. I always get these, I always get these mixed up, because I think it's one, then they actually turn out to the other. Um, let's go to Our Lady of Google. Well, he, he didn't like them, so he just... Um, well, okay, so the reasoning behind those is uh, um, there's a reason. So when, when the Bible was codified back in 325 AD, um, I'm trying to do that Catholic. Uh, they looked at, um, they had some criteria that um, they were kind of presenting this to kind of make sure they got the right books. Part of that was, um, well, okay, what's being used in liturgy now, right, in the liturgy around the area, but also what books can we actually go back to um, that actually were being used by Jesus himself in synagogue worship, right? So the 46 books that we have in our Bible were the same books that have been used by Jesus in the synagogue. If you went to the synagogue on a Saturday, these books be used as part of the liturgy, right? The other thing that we, they would do, and this is more for the New Testament, is authorship, right? That can be actually traced back to the author that wrote the book. Um, and also, that's in line with apostolic teaching, right? They came from the apostles. Um, so, here, so here it is. 1 and 2 Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, Sirach, Wisdom, and Baruch. Those are the books that are in our Bible, the Catholic Bible, not in the Protestant Bible. They were taken out by Martin Luther. When Martin Luther went back and, so basically he went with the understanding that, well, the Catholic Church has been wrong about other things. Let's look at other things they've been wrong about. And then he talked to Jewish leaders at the time, which was 1,500 years after the time of Jesus, and asked them what books they used in their liturgy in the synagogue. And so it was those 39 books that they gave to him and said, well, this is what we're using now. In Germany, at the time of Luther. Not necessarily in first century Palestine at the time of Jesus. And so he, now some of these he currently removed because, well, Tobit is a book that's really more directed towards marriage. And it was Martin Luther's understanding that marriage was not a sacrament. And so we don't necessarily give credence to the fact that marriage may be a sacrament, so Tobit probably should be knocked out of there. I think the other books, though, they were more based on what the synagogue worship was at the time of Martin Luther, not the time of Jesus, though. And Tobit may have been one of those two. Right? But that, that I think, is, gives some understanding of the reason why they why he did what he did. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. My that was pleasure. very educational. Oh, good. Hopefully it was. Oh, I, yeah, I think I learned some things. Then. All right, well, thank you. My pleasure. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Unless there's any questions, anything that we have, two people watch online, but most likely it's probably good to go. So uh, we'll see. We'll be here next week too for Bob the Father. That'll be at the normal time, at six thirty. Mm -hmm. So okay. uh, if you guys make it, it'd be great. Um, I'll send another flock note out that day up too. So. Okay. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks yeah, for coming. Good night.